We're starting a new series called Chasing the Wind. And we're going to start off with a story about a childhood friend. I'll try to hide this a little bit better here. Um, David Chris is his name, and he is, he's been a friend of mine for like 50 years. Actually, he's been long, well, yeah, 50 years, but beginning of junior high school, we met. And, and David, David um, is a lot like me, so maybe that's why we, we connected. Um, he uh, is also a lot not like me. So where, where I try, where I like to be, you know, nice to people, uh, friendly, uh, hopefully politically correct sometimes. Dave didn't worry, worry about any of those things. He just, you know, whatever he thought, he just kind of said. So um, he, was a, he was a good guy to have around if you wanted to know the truth. I always said, if you want the politically correct answer, come talk to me. If you want the unpolitically correct answer, you know, David's the guy you go to. Um, he became friends with, with my group of friends, actually. And I can still remember the one day that um, my, a buddy of mine had bought a um, Black Sabbath album, which being Christian kids, you weren't supposed to be listening to this stuff, right? So um, he, he bought this Black Sabbath album, and we took it back to his place to, to listen to it. It was Paranoid. Um, and there it is. Somebody's got it up on the screen for you. Um, so... We bought the album, took it back to his place. We're going to listen to this album. And his older sister found out what we were listening to and was not, and was not impressed. We went and got her mother. And her mother came down and took the album and was going to break it. We stopped her because my friend said, Mom, Mom, you can't break it. That's David's album. We'll take it back to him and give it to him. And so that stopped Mom, and she paused for a second, and she said, okay. Get it back to David. I don't want to see that, back, that in, my, in my house again. And so we took the album and he gave it to me. Um, but, you know, David just was kind of around us for those kind of things. And he's still somebody that I spend an awful lot of time with. I know that's hard for you to understand, but maybe I can explain it to you a different way. Have you ever heard of a guy named Pierre Delecto? He's a politician. In the States, he's, um, he's a Republican. Um, well, there he is. And if you're going to say, wait, that's not Pierre Delecto, that's Mitt Romney. Well, Pierre Delecto and Rep. Mitt Romney are the same person. Pierre Delecto was a social media uh, site that Mitt Romney had so that he could hear what people were saying without them having to say it to him. So they'd say things to Pierre that they would never say to him. Got the picture? David Chris doesn't exist. He's me. I invented him when I was in junior high school, often to write different things that I thought was a little bit maybe things that people wouldn't take from me. So, in fact, I can remember writing, uh, I, David wrote a lot of poetry and philosophy. And I can remember writing a poem. It was called City Boys. I still remember it. And it was in my bedroom. And my, the youth pastor came over, and he came down into my room. And he picked up this piece of paper, this, this poem written by David Chris. And um, he looked at it. And he said, that's a good poem. I said, yeah, I thought it was good. And he said, but that, whoever wrote that, that kid is in trouble. I said, yeah, yeah, I, I know, I know. He said, do you hang around with him a lot? I said, well, we, we hang around a bit. And he goes, well, you be careful when you're around him. And I said, oh, every time, all the time when I'm around him, I'm, I'm very careful. I, I'll, 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 I'll be careful, I promise. Um, he never did pick up that it was me writing the poetry. Why this journey into fantasy? Well, we're going to look at a book in just a second. And the book is an uncomfortable book. We're going to spend the, actually the next three weeks studying from it. But it, it, it's, not, it's not an easy book to read. Here, here's what one um, theologian, Robert Johnson, said about it. He said, medieval Old Testament scholars called this book one of the Bible's most dangerous books. Its paragraphs brim over with cynicism and even despair that seem out of place in the Bible's grand narrative. 
This is a dangerous book. You're going to read it. Not everybody feels this way. I, I like this, this thought. It's a little longer. But um, this is an Australian lady who wrote this in 2021. And she says, I'm growing more and more convinced that the only true mentally healthy reaction to living in this world is regular and profound periods of grief. Last year delivered so many opportunities, whether you lost someone to COVID or to another tragedy, or you didn't lose anyone, but we all felt the bleakness of a year lived in lockdown. For our part here in Sydney, we kicked off 2020 with ravaging wildfires. Then Kobe died, which was not an uncom uncomplicated matter. Then there was COVID and then the loss of George Floyd and the resulting protests across the country. Personally, the period of lockdown and, the, uh, and after, with all of its still and quiet moments, brought to the surface some very difficult subjects for me to face. And there is no way to escape this pain. No social engagements, no sporting events, no kids' birthdays to distract me. No way to be busy, to busy myself into a safe illusion that everything is being fine. All that came to the surface had to be dealt with. And more often than not, the way of dealing was to allow myself to feel devastating sadness, to grief. And so we have this, this book that is set apart, and, and it's uncomfortable, it's sad, it, it's hard to read at times, and we're not sure what we should do. And, and it's, it's written, we think, by Solomon. Solomon is, is who wrote Ecclesiastes. That's the book we're talking about, in case you didn't read the bottom of it there. Um, and, but we're not sure that it was Solomon. It, it could have been Solomon. We, we think it was Solomon, but we're not positive on that part uh, because he doesn't say who wrote it. Well, he actually does. He says this, the words of the teacher, son of David, king of Jerusalem. Now, that, that phrase, the words of the teacher, um, is actually the words of Koaleth, son of David, king of Jerusalem. And the author seems to be using Koaleth as a alias for something that is uncomfortable. If it was Solomon that wrote it, then it's this uncomfortable book that he wants to write under somebody's alias. We think it was Solomon basically because it's son of David living in Jerusalem, but that could have included many kings that came after Solomon as well. But here we have this this writing by Koaleth that is different from any other writing we have, really, in the Bible. I want to read, we're going to read the first uh, 10 verses, up to verse 10, but I'm really going to be concentrating just on that, on verse 2. So here's verse 2. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south, turns to the north, round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea never fall, is never full. To, place the streams, to the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are weary, wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing. The ear is full of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was already here long ago. It was here before our time. I'm trying to keep your notes right now, just write down the cycle of life. Life seems to come in, its, in, in waves, in a cycle. It seems to come to us and then leave and repeat itself again and again and again. When I was in junior high school, back when uh, David Chris became my, my buddy, 
I used to dress a little differently than I did than I do now. I don't know that that kind of probably surprises you. I did not dress. I did not dress like this when I was in grade eight. Um, I dressed usually with a pair of jeans that had bell bottoms. Remember bell bottoms? Um, I stopped growing in grade eight, so I was six foot two in grade eight. Um, and I like to wear platform shoes. And so I needed the bell bottoms to be long enough, if they were, if they were fitting right, that they would go down past and cover, cover my shoe and pass so, you know, so that you really wouldn't see my shoe when I was walking, which means they were, always, they were always tattered. Mom was always having to cut off these little strings from the bottom of it. Uh, she wanted me to throw them away, and I would never would. Um, but that was kind of the fashion then, right? We, uh, we just came and we did what we saw other people doing. In this case, we can probably blame these two for the bell bottoms, Sonny and Cher. I'm old enough to remember when they were actually married to each other. Um, but they wore, you can see, if you look at, their, look at the bottom, there they are, bell bottoms. And that was kind of the fad back when I was, when I was in junior high school. So that's what I wore with my platform shoes. My, my, my buddies used to say, if you're looking for Gary in the hallway, just look for the head bobbing above everybody else. Because by the 6'2 plus platform shoes, I was taller than everybody else in school. Um, but bell bottoms kind of went away, especially for men. Guys don't wear bell bottoms anymore, right? Girls sometimes. We've changed it. We've changed the name. We call them boot cut or flares. They're not bell bottoms anymore, but basically the same, the same thing. Um, and they became fads again in the 80s and in the 90s, mostly for girls, um, then in, in the 2000s again. And then all of a sudden, something changed. Sharon Haver, writing, um, says this. It's, it's as if all the girls wearing premium bootcut jeans, another word for bell bottoms, threw them away one day, and the next day began wearing skinny jeans and flats. It was less, everybody's wearing them, and all of a sudden, nobody's wearing them. They just, they just went away. Maybe never to return, except that Ecclesiastes says, everything will return. Everything will come back. It's just a cycle. And if, you're, and if we're thinking that Sonny and Cher kind of were the ones that started this, let me show you a picture of some sailors in 1854. Note what they're wearing on, their, on, on the bottom of their pants. Bell bottoms. Nothing's new. We're not, we're, we haven't discovered something that, that, that's not going to come again. It just is the way it is. This is it. When I was younger, although not as much younger as that, um, I used to wear a, a hairstyle called a mullet. You, some of you remember the mullet? I don't wear one anymore. I, I wore one probably longer than I should have. I, I can remember walking, the day that I lost it, I walked into the hairdressers for a trim and uh, she just sat, sat me down and said, listen, we've got to update your style. I said, what do you want to do? Cut off the mullet. Really? I kind of like it. <laughs> yeah, we're going to cut it off. Okay. What do you want? I, I trust you. You're going to cut it off, and I don't, know what, I don't know what this is going to look like, but okay. And she cut it off. The mullet has a history. And Kiefer Sutherland thinks it goes back to him in The Lost Boys. There he is wearing a, a mullet. Um, the, the term mullet actually seems to come from Beastie Boys uh, and their song Mullet Head, in case you wanted to know. But then, of course, there's this guy. His name is Billy Idol, and he seems to have a bit of a mullet going on there. Um, so we're not really sure like, who started it, when it began, except in 2018... Digging in England, some people unearthed a statue, a little small iron statue that dated to about the time of Christ. And they lifted this thing out of the dirt and looked at it, and it looked like the figurine had a mullet. Nothing's new. One historian after that came out and said, well, that makes sense. 
because if you've got it short here, then you're keeping the hair out of your eyes. But the length, or the, 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 at the back, the mullet part, it keeps your neck warm and gives you some protection back there. So in ancient times, wearing a mullet actually probably made sense. But there's nothing new. Everything you've done, you, it, it will happen again. Um, I have a friend who uh, every once in a while comes over and says, you know, um, I think I've got something. <laughs> I found, I found something that nobody else has ever seen. And he, sh- and he tells me about it, and I say, yeah, I read a book about, about that a few years ago. You mean that's not new? I said, no. Everything is, everything is old. Everything is cycled. There's nothing new that you can figure out. It's just going to come back and come back and come back. One of my favorite bands when I was a kid is called, was a band called Klaatu. And Klaatu was a group of three Canadian um, studio mu- musicians. But when they came on the scene, people thought they were the Beatles. And the problem with Klaatu, at least in their first three albums, was they didn't list who was Klaatu. It was just music. And all the songs were, were written by the Klaatuns. So there was, no, there, there was no way of telling who it was. But especially the first album sounded a lot like the Beatles. And so people started to buy their albums thinking that they were the Beatles. They weren't. They were three studio mu- mu- musicians from Toronto. In 1978, um, Klaatu wrote a song that actually John Wolaszczak, we now, we now know, wrote it. Um, it sounds a lot like something that Coleth would love to have written. Here it is. So tell me, what's the point of playing the game? With so much to lose, yet so little to gain, you sell your life away. Can't you see you're just a cog working like a dog? You trade your future for a dead-end job that's full of routine days. Everything in its cycle. Everything old will be new again. There's nothing new under the sun. According to Cola, there's nothing new. Whatever you think, it's not new. Again, in your notes, just write down the vapor of life. Because not only is there nothing new, but there's nothing permanent. Koleth writes that it is meaningless. It is like vapor. It is like going out on a cold day. Ever been out on a cold day in Edmonton? No? Um, don't worry, you'll, you'll get a chance. It's coming. Um, you go out and you breathe, right? And you can see your breath. You can see it coming out. But it doesn't hang around very long. It's just, it, it comes out and then it disappears. It comes out and then it disappears. Everything, not only is it a cycle, it's going to come around again, but it's also, it, it's also vapor. It, it doesn't have any substance. There's nothing to it. It's just going to come out and disappear. Come out and disappear. 1971, Carly Simon wrote what is probably her most famous song. Um, she actually took a long time writing it because, well, she had some, some setbacks with it. The original in 1971 was called Bless You, Ben. Um, so she had a, this song called Bless You, Ben. She wrote the lyrics to it, had the music to it. And um, then she decided she didn't really like the lyrics, so she set it aside. And I've, I've got an example, Bless You, Ben. You came in when nobody else left off, and I'm going, yeah, Carly, I understand why you don't like the lyrics. Uh, What does that even mean? Um, But anyways, it went on the shelf, and then she went to a party. And she went to this party with a friend, and and they they were talking, and all of a sudden, somebody walked in the door. And her friend kind of elbowed her in the stomach and said, look, look at him. He's walking into the party like he's walking onto a yacht. And Carly Simon goes, that sounds like a good line. So she wrote it down, and then she went back to Bless You, Ben, and put that line into Bless You, Ben. Only it changed the whole meaning of the song. Then she kind of did a total rewrite of the song. And it became, you're so vain. The opening line, you walked into the party like you were walking onto a yacht. Meaning... You think you're important. But everything you have is meaningless. 
Coleth would have been great with his line. There's nothing that you have that you should feel special about. That's why you're so vain. That's the, that is the, the chorus. You're so vain. You probably think this song is about you. You're so vain. You probably think this song is about you, don't you? Then if you didn't hear it, don't you? Then if you didn't hear it, don't you? Tell you the truth, I never really liked the song. Um, but there was a couple questions that came out of that song. The part that I really didn't like was the lyrics itself. I just felt it was, you know, it, it left something to be desired. Uh, for instance, if you write a song about me, and I think it's about me, does that make me vain? I mean, you did write the song about me. Now, if you didn't write the song about me, then maybe I'd be vain, but really, you know, if you can write a song about me, that was one. The other thing is, whoever writes a song and put Gavit in it, what is it? Well, it's a dance, or, or apparently it's what a guy does when he looks into a mirror walking by, kind of preening on himself. Made no sense to me. But the other question was, who in the world is she talking about? And, you know, we just love to know, right? We've got to know who it was. So what happens is that Warren Beatty comes up and says, well, you've got to know, your, your Sylvain's about me. Carly did not say that it was, but Warren is convinced that, you, that your Sylvain was written about, about him. Angie Bowie, Bowie said, I used to be married to the guy who that song's about, meaning David. Again, Carly's quiet. She's, she's not saying yes or no. So then people started saying, well, who else could it be about? And so they've come up with some ideas. Uh, Cat Stevens. Now he's, now he's called Yousef. Um, songs about him. Now, again, Carly nor Cat have ever said anything about that. And another suggestion, which I kind of liked, was um, everybody's, oh, sorry, I don't keep on saying that, every girl's favorite partridge. Because guys like Lori, you know, you know we, we, we all liked Lori back then. But the girls all liked David, David Cassidy, Keith. Every girl wanted to be around Keith. See him being in, in your Sylvain. For Carly's part, she just has given us two that it's definitely not. She says no to Mick Jagger and no to her former husband, James Taylor. She let, leaves the, everything else wide open. But unfortunately, all of that kind of misses the point. The song is, a, is, is about somebody who walks into a party and they think that they're important, but they're not. They think there's something special about them, but it's meaningless, it's vapor, it's nothing. And they can't get that through their head. And so Carly says, you know, just understand that this, what you think is important just isn't important. Coleth says the same to us. What you think is important just isn't important. It is meaningless. There's, there's nothing to it. It's vapor. It's here for a moment, and then it's gone. So why do you get so wrapped up in this stuff that comes and goes so quickly? I heard an interview with Scott Hamilton a number of years Sorry, yeah. Scott, a number of years ago, figure skater, and he... Um, he was teaching a bunch of younger stars. And so he'd go out and he'd show them some moves and, you know, then they'd sit down and they'd talk. And, and Scott would say, so why in the world do you want to do this? Why do you want to go through all of this? And they say, well, we want to win world championships. We want to win the gold medal. So why do you want to do that? So that you'll be remembered? So that you own a piece of history? And they said, yeah, that's what we want. We want history to remember us. So we want to go out and win a, a gold medal. We want to go out and... And, and do something special. And then Scott would come up with the second question. So tell me, who won the figure skating world championship in 1962? Because that person wanted a piece of history just like you do. And you can't remember who they are, do you? You'll be remembered for a little while. But it will fade. It's vapor. It, it, it just will, has no permanence. It will not keep you in the minds of people. You'll become a footnote in history that somebody will have to look up. 
And to be very blunt with you, I did look it, look it up this week to find out who did win it. I can tell you it was a Canadian. I've already forgotten the name. Maybe not a surprise considering who I am. Um, but it's just here for a moment. There's, there's nothing of permanence. There's, there's nothing here. So why do you struggle? After things that don't matter. Why do you do what? Why do you put effort into things that will not last? That's Cole Les' question. And everything that you think is important will not last. So, why? It's the existential problem of life. Why? I love this by Jay Stafford Wright. He writes, the teacher has confronted us with a situation that today we might call existential. Man exists in a series of experiences and cannot discover any onward meeting in them. All he can do is exist and make the best of what comes or drop out altogether. Doesn't sound like very good choices. I gotta make the most of every day just to survive to tomorrow. I've got to keep going or drop out. But it's all meaningless, according to Cola. Nothing to it. So what is he trying to tell us? And actually, I think I know what he's trying to tell us. And it was something that Jesus tried to tell talk to us about. Jesus told us a parable about a landowner in a vineyard. And in the parable, he said, a landowner went out and he found some workers that would come and work in his vineyard. He went out in the morning and he brought them back and they worked in his vineyard. At mid-morning, he went back again and he found more workers that hadn't found a job and said, come and I will pay you and you can work in my vineyard. And so he brought them and he worked them in his and he worked them in his vineyard. He went out at noon and found some more, and he brought them back. He went out in mid-afternoon, and he brought them back. He went out at five o'clock, an hour before everything was was supposed to be done, and said, why are you not working? And they said, because nobody's given us a job. He said, well, then come with me, and I will give you a job for the last hour of the day. And so after he brought them in, and they had worked, and the day was over, he went to pay them, and he started with those who came last. They'd only worked for an hour, and he gave them their pay. Then the people who had come at three gave them their pay. Those that came at noon gave them their pay. Those that came at 10 in the morning gave them their pay. Those who came for the full day. And the guys that came for the full day thought they were going to get a lot of money because they had been there all day and they noticed that some of these people who had only been there for a part of the day were getting as much money as they had been promised. But when they came before the landowner, he started to give them their money. They said, well, don't we deserve more? We were here for the whole day. And the landowner said, but you agreed to work for this amount of money. What does it matter to you what I pay them? This is how much we agreed on. Take your money. And at the end of that story, Jesus says, and the first will be last, and the last will be first. It's not a story about economics. It's a story about the generosity of a vineyard owner. It's a story about how we should maybe take care of each other. But it's not about economics. It's not about the vineyard. It's not about the things that Cole Leth would say meaningless. Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And his disciples came up with some responses. Some said that you're Elijah, come back. Some say that you're John the Baptist. And Jesus said, who do you say I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the the living God. And Jesus' response was, yes, Peter. And that was not told you by human authorities, but from our heavenly Father. And I tell you that that on this rock, on this confession, that Jesus is the son of God, we will build my church. 
And then Jesus started to talk about how he was going to die. And Peter stood up and said, no, Jesus, that's not going to happen. And Jesus looked at Peter, who he had just said was the rock on which he would build his church, and said, get behind me, Satan. And then he said this story. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their own soul? Or, how, or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Meaningless, meaningless, says Koalath. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And part of our, our struggle in our culture is that we have filled ourselves with things that are meaningless. We have filled our arms with things that are nothing but vapor and they are disappearing. And because that's what we're holding, we can't reach for what is important. If you had your hands full of groceries and you were walking into your house or your apartment and a little kid trips and falls and smashes their face onto the pavement, what do you do? Put down your groceries and grab hold of the child. The child's more important. The groceries you can get later. Jesus is saying, listen, you've filled yourself, your, your, your arms with so much stuff that does not matter, that you have nothing left for me. All you have is everything that is meaningless, taking up that space where I should be. Back in the day, we used to sing a, a, a song written by the Gaithers. Simply, more of you, more of you. I've had all but what I need, just more of you. Of things I've had my fill, and yet I hunger still, empty and bare. Lord, hear my prayer for more of you. Empty and bare. God, I have gotten rid of everything that is meaningless in my life everything that I thought was important, everything that took up space in my life, Koaleth has told me is meaningless, and I have gotten rid of it so that I can have more of you, so that I can come before you and be filled by you. But as long as we're filled with the meaningless and the vapor, there's no room for God. You sing that song with me? More of you, more of you. I've had all but what I need, just more of you. Of things I've had my fill, and yet I hunger still. Empty and bare, Lord, hear my prayer. For more of you. Is that your prayer this morning? Sing it again. More of you. More of you. I've had all but what I need. Just more of you. Of things I've had my fill. And yet I hunger still. Empty and bare, Lord, hear my prayer for more of you. As long as we collect the meaningless and the vapor, there's no room for God to fulfill that prayer. What we need is more of him. All we need is more of him. Let me pray. Father, we are so thankful that you come. That you are here in this room with us. You walked in the doors with us. And God, we, we know 
that we are clinging on to things that we shouldn't cling on to. We're clinging on to the stuff that is meaningless, that is vapor and will soon disappear, all the while needing more of you. So we ask you in this moment to come, fill us. Help us to understand what it is that we need to leave behind so that we can cling on to you. God, we would rather be empty of everything else and full of you than the other way around. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Help us. Help us to understand you. Understand the words that Koalith tells us about everything being meaningless and vanity so that we can cling on to more of you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. Oh, no.